Welcome everyone to the University of New South Wales. I'm David Burt, the Director of Entrepreneurship uh, here at the university. I lead the Founders Program um, and I'm really excited for the purpose of today, which is to learn more about the Kaufman Foundation and just how powerful philanthropy can be to supporting entrepreneurship. Um, in Australia, the connection between sort of philanthropic support and um, helping people to be entrepreneurial um, doesn't have a lot of history. Um, at UNSW, we're really kind of leading the way. In fact, this very building um, only exists because of philanthropy, but that, that's a story for another day. The story for today is the Kaufman Foundation. Um, I'm really excited to have Philip Gaskin with us. Um, Philip is a senior leader from the Kaufman Foundation in the United States. Uh, he's very briefly visiting Australia for a conference in Melbourne. Uh, and when I called him up a couple of weeks ago, he very kindly agreed to come to Sydney just to speak to us today before he heads off uh, on the next leg of his journey. So we're very lucky to have him with us. Um, the Kaufman Foundation, uh, I won't steal Philip's thunder telling you about it, but from, uh, from our perspective at UNSW, it definitely is really the world leading foundation supporting um, entrepreneurship philanthropically. When you look at both the scale of what it's accomplished um, as well as the, um, the history. Uh, and the other thing that's really great is um, they're really great at sharing their learnings with the rest of the world, even though their mandate is to support entrepreneurship in the US. Um, they publish a number of really fantastic uh, insights and reports, um, and then also travel the world sharing their insights uh, with the global community. Um, so in terms of our guest today is Philip Gaskin. Um, he's currently a strategic advisor to the CEO of the Corkman Foundation. Um, he has a remarkable career history of creating um, outcomes in this space, um, as well as others. Uh, he was previously um, the chief operating officer at Impact Hub, um, and he also has um, a lot of experience in um, political organizing campaigns. Um, previously, he was vice president of entrepreneurship at the Kaufman Foundation, um, and in that role was responsible for an annual budget of about US $50 million, um, which was around grant making, as well as policy, research, and advocacy. Um, I've been lucky enough to hear Philip speak a couple of times, and I'm really looking forward to this as well. Um, so please join me in welcoming Philip Gaskin. Morning, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'm going to go over. I have a, a lot of slides. I can talk about Coffin for hours, but. I, um, I'm going to go over the, the who we are, what we are, how we started, and what we focus on. Um, but it, it, at any time, if there's certain uh, parts of the presentation where I'm in, and a question is just really, really burning, you need to know something right then, feel free to, feel free to interrupt. I, um, because the Kaufman story is deep, it's wide, um, and it's, it's rather diverse, and it's different. Uh, Mr. Kaufman who I'll introduce you to here in the slides in a second, always wanted us to be known as an uncommon foundation, doing things in an uncommon way to help common people is the way that he said it. I'm gonna uh, start us out um, with a video of Mr. Kaufman, and then we'll dive, we'll dive right in. solve the problems of society by throwing money at it, but it sure gives you a wonderful feeling when you do it right and you accomplish something that helps humanity. We need to prepare our youth of today. They are going to be the leaders of the future. So it's absolutely necessary to have good education. Plus, in my judgment, the way to eliminate discrimination and racial discord is education. If you give those kids hope for the future, if they let them know that somebody cares about them, you'll be surprised at what they can achieve. 
with your high school graduation, you now have the power to choose what you will make of your lives. Choose well. Choose well. We believe that we can pass on some of the philosophies and principles, techniques, leadership tactics that will enable new entrepreneurs to be successful. It's your right to be uncommon if you can. You seek opportunity to compete. You desire to take the calculated risk to dream, to build, yes, even to fail, and to succeed. The greatest satisfaction that I have had is helping others, doing something that either inspires them or aids them so that they'll be not only a better person, but be a better productive citizen of the United States. All of the money in the world cannot solve problems unless we work together. If we work together, there is no problem in the world that can stop us as we seek to develop people to the highest and best potential. So that video was done on uh, 100th anniversary uh, celebrating his life, but the video was actually done um, before that, but it was um, filmed just a couple of months before he had, he had passed away. Um, and one of the things he, he says in there, which is one of my favorite quotes, is what he mentions about all the money in the world can't solve problems alone. It's only if we can, if we work together, will it solve problems? So let me take you through a little bit of his life. So. Um, he grew up, not a lot of resources, grew up in rural Missouri. Um, his mom and dad helped him how to read and write. Um, and after a while he found himself, he got to college, he found himself doing pharmaceutical sales. And he was a really good salesperson. So good that his territory got cut because he was making too much money. He was doing too well. And the president of the company he was working for got jealous of him, kicked him out, basically. So he said, all right, well, I'm going to take $5,000 and go into my basement and start a company. And he named it Marion Laboratories. Marion is his middle name. And he did that because it sounded big, like it was more than one person. It was just himself. Um, and over time, he became successful and started a company, uh, well, Marion Laboratories got bigger in Kansas City and ended up employing 2,000 people. Um, there was a, a drug, he did two things. There's one is he, he created uh, plastic coating on drugs. It was one of the things that he did. And another drug, which was a calcium supplement. And both of those two things is where he really, he really got started. But it was all because of just starting with $5,000 and going into his basement and, and saying, I'm going to do something. A number of years later, he sold it to Merrill Dow and took the $700 million proceeds and started the Kauffman Foundation on the premise that everyone should have a fundamental right to an education and to economic independence through enterprise. And that's where the entrepreneurship part, part comes in. So you see on here on the picture, um, in the bottom right is him addressing thousands of employees at Marion Laboratories. On the upper right, uh, see he's at a baseball stadium. So one of the things, one of his legacies in Kansas City is bringing the Kansas City Royals baseball team back from Oakland when Charlie Finley let it go, back from Oakland um, to Kansas City. And so if you come to Kansas City, the Kansas City Royals play at Kauffman Stadium. 
So the, um, we uh, finally won a world championship. It was af unfortunately after um, he had passed when we won the, the second one. Um, also coming to Kansas City, you would see the, the, the foundation, and that is the campus of the foundation with wonderful waterway there and actually on the outside. And then um, in the honor of the Grand Dame here in Sydney is the Kaufman Center for Performing Arts, which was designed, inspired from the Opera House. Um, it is one of the top rated um, acoustically in the Western Hemisphere now. Uh, internally, it was done off of uh, Lincoln Center in New York with uh, the two halls. So if you, if you visit it, if you visit Kansas City, I highly, highly recommend you, you going to it. So what do we, what do we do? So today it is more opportunity, stronger community. So we look, looking at, I said before, uh, education and entrepreneurship, looking at through the lens of how do people reach financial stability, economic mobility, economic prosperity, and upward mobility. So we're now be looking at it because of all the different barriers in the United States as it relates to capital, education, a number of different things. How do people go through the arc of life and be supported from the time they're a kid all the way through career? So our work is in Kansas City predominantly. Over 75% of our funding is Kansas City. The rest is, is national. Um, Mr. Kaufman, it's in the donor intent that all funding be in the US. It can if it's a U.S. organization that does things globally or supports things globally, that's fine, but it has to be in the U.S. Um, and our nationwide work is through programs, research, and policy. And in, I'll talk about entrepreneurship here just for a second. So the research in grant making and programs is based on looking at, I go back to that, that workforce. Right? You'll see a, a terminology here a little bit later called entrepreneur-focused economic development is how we're grounding our entrepreneurship in that. It includes workforce, it includes communities, it includes entrepreneurs themselves. Majority nonprofits. Um, sometimes uh, we will fund things that are for-profit organizations, but that's very, very rare um, because it's harder to it's harder to come up with a charitable purpose when it's going to a for-profit. So say to grant making this to nonprofit organizations. And again, um, as you heard Mr. Kaufman say, looking at um, everything through the lens of racial equity, he just sees that education and economic opportunity is one of the best ways to solve that and getting to a better life and quality, equality for all. So I'll go into um, what we do on the education side of the house. Most of what I'll be spending today is gonna be on the education and the research side, uh, on the entrepreneurship and the research side. Um, but I'll talk about um, education, learning and development. So the mission is for students of all ages to have the necessary academic and mental skills to succeed in the next phase of their education and learning. And so, we have a Ewing Marion Kaufman School, which is a charter school, a, um, a middle, middle school charter school that we started to try to, that was our beginning of trying to re-engineer education for youngsters in Kansas City. Um, it's a very interesting city where you've got 30 different school districts all in a, in a geographic area. And so we have a Kaufman School we also do out of school support and that's after school programs because the data just shows that people drop out, so to speak, of the system between after school and going home. That there's something thereafter that the data is showing that people are just, whether getting lost in their path or whatever it may be. So we do a number of out of school support programs. Um, Pro X is a new internship where it's an internship program in Kansas City where corporates now um, for the summer months, corporates come and support entrepreneurs and provide them with internships during the summer and into, into the future. So it's companies like Ernst & Young and others are participating this in the Kansas City area. 
and then real world learning. What we try to, what we say is that the, the high school diploma itself means nothing anymore. It has to be re-engineered. There's no bridge. The high school diploma in the US is a cliff versus a bridge. The people are they're graduating, kids are graduating unprepared for the next thing. And so what we've begun is a accreditation program called Real World Learning. We're working with those 30 school districts in Kansas City so that by 2032, up to 80% of students in these selected school districts could graduate with one of five market value assets, accreditations and entrepreneurship and other type of things. We're tying that to corporates so that there's a funnel. The challenge is we've got, a, a, there are a lot of companies in the US or in the Kansas City area that are just complaining that they cannot find people to fill jobs. They're not seeing the students and the students aren't seeing them. So we're creating a, a conjunctive pathway so that the corporate, and the corporates may need to change their job descriptions. They need to change how they recruit. They may need to change their own marketing. Students may, uh, may want be, be able to influence what corporates do internally. There are a lot of kids that either can't go to college, don't wanna go to college, don't know how to get there or what have you. So this is about engaging both the students and others uh, in learning in learning programs. And School Smart KC is a spin out nonprofit. All of these that I'm mentioning are spin outs of the foundation. They're their standalone 501c3 organizations. And School Smart was created because you've got the 30 different school districts and the interconnectedness is just not there. So that's Kaufman doing its best to cross pollinate from that, from that perspective. So entrepreneurship, um, as Mr. Kaufman said, it's, it's the way to, it's, it's the way for career readiness, a career and life readiness all the way through. And so we tie that now though to community. So the strategy that we started when it started in 2016, was about taking our, our strategy from one of what are the research data metrics, right? That we believe are important and turned it completely upside down and said, we're gonna begin a strategy that's bottom up. That is community level driven to look at what are all the systemic barriers that get in the way of entrepreneurs starting and growing businesses on a daily basis especially from those communities where people are most left behind. And how can philanthropy play in that in a way, and almost from a for-profit perspective is this to say is, we have, a, we have a, a duty to improve lives and communities. We have a duty to become an economic development actor and not see ourselves just passively as a foundation. One of the challenges that foundation has and issues that people have with foundation in the States is that philanthropy is too passive and takes too long for, to, to grant or come with an idea. That it, it, it has to wait so long on what the data shows and what the evaluation shows. And by the time that shows something, the problems have changed already. So you have to be more urgent. Um, and so looking at the career life rate is our, our key um, areas, and I'll hit on this in a little bit, uh, a little bit, is our ecosystems playbook. What are ecosystems? People, who can define an ecosystem here for me? I always love hearing what people. Exactly, it's hard. <laughs> keep it, keep it simple. It's a, it's, it's a community. It's going to be a community, a biologic community, a human community. The key is what is an effective ecosystem? It's getting resources from an entrepreneurial ecosystem, getting resources from someone who has it, from someone who needs it in the quickest amount of time, the least amount of friction. The problem for entrepreneurs is that we cre created mazes for them to go through of, who do I find for funding and who do I find for support and who do I find for my, and too many people tire out, right? So an effective entrepreneurial ecosystem was trying to change that. 
Um, one million cups is um, an idea that started in our cafeteria 12 years ago, where someone slapped us across the head and said, you're the foundation for entrepreneurship. How about if you invite entrepreneurs to the foundation? So many entrepreneurs running on the city say, Kaufman, can you help me find people? How about if we have you all here? So we started on, on one Wednesday morning and about 20 entrepreneurs there. And that has turned into 12 years later, a program called One Million Cups, which is now in 130 cities across the United States, where every Wednesday, two entrepreneurs get up in front of a crowd of those that support them. It's not a pitch session. It's just talking about where they are in their business and how can the audience help them, right? Some entrepreneurs call that church for entrepreneurs. I've got to be there every Wednesday morning and that type of thing. And so very successful program on the learning side, Kaufman Fast Track is our longest standing program. And that's taught in about 120 cities right now. Um, affiliates teach on, uh, startup and growth. Um, and there's an online version of it as well. So there's about 60,000 entrepreneurs have gone through that since it, since it started. And then on capital access, um, and I'll touch on this a little bit later. Our capital access work is about, and this is what we want to see more of philanthropy do, is how to influence private equity. Philanthropy, you're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to invest in for-profit things. You can't do that. You'll lose your accreditation and all that. We have found ways to do that by smart grant making which then grants to an intermediary who then grants to for-profits. The Capital Access Lab is an idea that we got because um, our research showed us that 83% of entrepreneurs do not access traditional bank loans or venture capital at the time of starting a business. If 83% of entrepreneurs don't do that, like something's wrong. If venture capital, 75% of venture capital is going to five US cities. If you're in the middle of a state or the middle of the country, I guess venture capital thinks your idea is not very good. And if you're a woman entrepreneur, even where it's across tabs across the board, and I have research, I'll show you this, it's really, really tough. So we said, look, how do we, Who's trying to change this? We found that there are these funds that are being run that are doing something called alternative-based financing. And revenue-based financing is the major model. And what that is, is the entrepreneur who can't get venture, who can't get the bank loan because the bank says your credit score is three points too low or whatever, we'll grant you the money and you don't have to pay us back until you start making revenues. And so what we did is to say, this is really interesting. We, needed, we did a request for a proposal to, to see across the nation who's doing those things. And we, got, we thought we'd get five or six funds. We had 110. We were blown away by it. And so what we did was we asked the board for a $3 million grant. We put the grant into a donor advised fund intermediary. And we, the intermediary then funded six of those funds to run a test to see how their work was doing, right? We wanted to test three things. One, are those models really working? Two, if we put money into them, could they then take that money and expand it out and, and raise, get, raise more money? And three, would more philanthropy do what we're doing and come in and put in more than the three million? Well, the last was an utter failure because we couldn't get philanthropy, other philanthropy. Hey, that sounds like a great idea, but can you run it all? No. But the other two were a big success. That three million dollars, and actually, I'm sorry, one philanthropy came in, Rockefeller came in with $500,000. They have now raised, those six funds have now raised $180 million dollars investing in 60 entrepreneur companies. 90% of those companies are outside of those five VC markets. The majority are into women and people of color. And that's what we wanted to prove out and is to see how can philanthropy find a way to influence something to just leverage our money and see if it works and it has. 
that has now led to what we've done in Kansas City called the Credit Enhancement Fund. It's another thing of, of the importance of philanthropy in, in entrepreneurship. So in Kansas City, it's a very traditional banking market, very traditional, right? And during COVID, we um, put an 800, started an $800,000 fund at a community development financial institution. It's like an alternative to a bank. And we went around the city to the traditional banks and said, you've got to put money into this fund because Kansas City small businesses are about to go under and we've got to save them. We got no response from the banks. Luckily, the community development financial institution itself was able to raise, even nationwide, took our 800,000 and raised 7 million off of that. Not very much from Kansas City. So here's what happened. They did 172, I think is later, micro loans. And these are micro loans, 25,000 and under, because these businesses don't need that much. They just need something to buy the next truck or the next refrigerator for the restaurant, whatever. To this day, not one default on the loan. So what did we do? When we started getting this data, we started going to the banks. We worked with the Chamber of Commerce. This is something else that philanthropy can do is work cross sector. So we worked with the Chamber of Commerce and we started a capital access task force. We brought all 30 banks in and over a year and a half, we took them through an inclusive lenders training to learn about these new markets, to learn about these entrepreneurs that they think are completely non-investable or what have you. They came along, they came along, they came along. We said, okay, what about now we invest? Well, it's, we're still too risky for us. It's just not in our model. Our CEOs won't go for it. So we finally said, oh, okay, how about if we put up money to guarantee you your loans? So the Kansas City Credit Enhancement Fund is a $9 million fund that Kaufman has put up and says to these banks, if you agree to do microloans into these identified neighborhoods in Kansas City, we'll back you 15% on every loan. Six banks so far have said yes. Based on their proposals, that's an additional $30 million that will now go into the Kansas City lending market. And so it's just thinking of, we, 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 it's the uncommon, back to the word uncommon, it's just thinking about how can philanthropy be different to help people start, grow, survive, whatever it may, it may be. I'm going to stop there for questions because I'm going to go into a couple of other things. And uh, I'm going to go into a little bit more deep dive on the ecosystems, on One Million Cups, on our ecosystems philosophy, if I don't knock my glasses off, and um, capital access. Yes. Thank you so much. That was so cool. Thank you so much. I'm Dina from David's team. Um, oh. No, it's on. Um, my name is Dina from David's team. Um, that's fascinating. I would love to hear about timelines. So you mentioned that um, this donor advised fund where you put three millions in and that those turn into six various funds and then you saw this global impact. Mm -hmm. Timeline wise, how long did it take you from the three million to going global? Where we are now is about two years. Two years? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. These funds, I mean, look, they're entrepreneurs. They're entrepreneurs running the funds. They know what they're doing. They just need a chance, just like everyone else, right? Two years. And so we're going to keep, it's a live lab. We'll keep doing it. We're still trying to get other philanthropy to come in and put more money and we'll just, we'll just keep doing it. Any others before I go on? Yes. Hi, I'm Emma Rouse. I'm working in development, Hi. which is like advancement here at UNSW. And I just wondered how um, you found the interest from other philanthropists in co-investing in a fund such as the one you set up. Yeah, in, in the, the one we set up, we didn't, we got a lot of interest. We didn't get a lot of money into it. Um, and it was because philanthropy, each philanthropy has its own donor intent, what it has to do, how it can do it. What they mostly preferred is, can you just do what's called a fund of funds? Can you start where we, everyone just putting in money and I can sell that better versus an experiment? So we've now done that. 
So we have put uh, our largest commitment ever out of entrepreneurship, a $10 million commitment into as an organization in the United States called Living Cities, which is a, a, an organization made up of 19 leading philanthropic and financial institutions. And so we've been, we're first in commitment on their next fund, which hopes to be a $100 million fund, but it's patterned off of our lab, basically. Um, so we're first in investment on that. And I expect, I know MacArthur, is show, MacArthur Foundation is showing interest, McKnight Foundation is showing interest, and a few others so far. So we hope because it's through that model of an organization with the foundations already at the table that we'll get, we'll get more. Okay. So I'm going to run through that ground up approach real quick that we were talking about. And it's basically, I, I started October, 2016. I hired um, the first program officer two months later and said, we're going to try this. <laughs> we're going to do it. It's an experiment. We're going to do it. And that was our research. So we knew that traditional methods of encouraging entrepreneurship are not pr producing desired results. It's, can't just give cities tax incentives or it's not just about just capital. It's more than that, especially if you have dense ecosystems like Silicon Valley that aren't working for everyone. It's, it's very exclusive, right? This is still true in the U.S., which is shocking, but per capita startup rates are still flatlined. They, it, you, we saw a little bit of uptick after COVID because people were displaced so that had to start business. We're just not seeing entrepreneurship and startup rate increase the way that the way that they should. And um, in the U.S., uh, people of color own half as many businesses as others. Uh, immigrants are most likely to get bank loans. Rural entrepreneurs facing um, increasingly uphill battle. Um, and the geography is changing in the U.S. too. You have rural environments are drying up people moving to cities, who's going to replace rural. They're doing that because they get over, what did I say about the five cities and the venture capital? They get overlooked all the time, right? And so we think that eco, entrepreneurial ecosystem building is that emerging model, and it will stay emerging for economic development in this connected age. And we have a connected age, but we have too many ecosystems, cities, communities that are disconnected. Um, so it seems that what we've been doing has been working. So tell the story. All right. So let's say this is Maria. So Maria's got a really good idea for a business. And everyone's charging on, you go, you got a really great idea. Um, but like all entrepreneurs, she doesn't have all the resources or knowledge that she needs, right? The good news out in her, in her community that there are a whole bunch of resources out there. She needs to go around, get help with her endeavor from all these different people, but her job is a little bit more complex. Um, but actually the solution is pretty straightforward. So the complex part is she has to run around to all these places in town in the right order. Somehow she's got to figure out what the right order is um, to get all the answers to what she needs, all the talent, all the knowledge. And she's got to do it before she runs out of cash before she runs out of drive and before her friends or her partner or whatever say, you need to go get a day job, right? And just, or, or she just runs out. We actually did research. It's called our Entrepreneurship Leavers Report, L-E-A-V-E-R-S, and all of this is on our website. It said, one of the main reasons why people leave entrepreneurship is because of their social, their social circles encouraging them, them to stop pulling them back, that it's just more comfortable, be like us, or a number of different things. And, I, and some of it's cultural. I mean, I may come with uh, my family and our culture was not, was to get degrees, but not anything starting businesses or what have you was seen as, oh, that's too risky. You got to be safe, right? Um, so our job as community leaders um, is to identify all the resources that could help Maria and connect them all together before she shows up. 
right? Now, for too many people, it's the reverse. Um, and research shows that entrepreneurship, innovation, and creativity thrive in dense networks, thus Silicon Valley or others. Now, I always caveat, don't try to be like Silicon Valley because it's very exclusive and it's a dessert, right? Really good things about Silicon Valley, don't get me wrong. It's a, it's a tough ecosystem for many people. So this new model, we believe a new model of economic development is required. On the blue, on the left side is, sure, it's about providing capital, tech, and tech training, all that, but it's the other side that has to be infused. Social capital, trust, everything moves at the speed of trust in communities, right? In, in community building. And it's so, it's not a yes, it's a yes and, it's not an or, but all of those different things are how, you know, and what we're, we've been driving in, in entrepreneurship. So what we did was in 2017, we began first of four entrepreneurship summits. And we said, all right, who are these ecosystem builders out there in the United States? We got 450 of them together in one room to begin design thinking process to go through how does ecosystem building, what is it and how does it get professionalized? Because people are doing these jobs and ecosystem builders and many personas. It's a mayor, it's an academic, right? It's a teacher, it's an entrepreneur, it's a nonprofit, it's everyone has a role. And what we did was this group designed seven design principles of what goes into an effective entrepreneurial ecosystem of how you build it. And these are the seven. Um, and I will, um, I'm going to go into a little bit more depth of them here in a, in a second, but well, I'll do it now and I'll skip over the other ones. Put entrepreneurs front and center. How many people have had a meeting about entrepreneurs and no entrepreneur was in the room? <laughs> Say, perhaps someone was honest enough to tell the truth in the back. <laughs> Happens all the time. There's a passion about entrepreneurship. I get it. But who's not in the room? Sometimes the entrepreneur isn't. Um, fostering conversations is very important. Just talk and try to figure out who, do, who, who might need help. How do I talk about what I'm doing? Asking someone else, tell me more about your business. Tell me more about your needs. And then it bleeds in with collaboration as well. Everyone's invited. What also happens, in, in, and this happens especially in economic development. And my economic development friends are going to start hearing a lot from me because I just got elected to the board of the International Economic Development Council. <laughs> and they have to get ready for me. But um, who's not in the room? The usual players are not solving it by themselves right now. So you have to add, always ask that question in your meetings. Who's not in the room? Who's here? And it's okay if you don't know who they are or how to find them or how to talk to them or whatever. But do ask that question and ask someone else that question. There are people out there that want to be included but don't see the words in entrepreneurship and innovation intimidate people. Um, living the values. That's living the values um, of your uh, I think I've got that. There we go. Real quickly. This is a big one. Don't worry about it. Take a picture of it, whatever. The group came up with these. That if you live the values of community building, right? These are the things that you have to do. And the one at the end is one of the biggest. Building trust. Get into that a little bit later. Um, also on our website, coffin.org forward slash playbook, you can find all of this. Um, we put this to test out in four cities. We'll talk about that a little later. So here are the seven, um, just in summary. Um, what I did, connecting people, bottom up, top down, outside in. It's not just about economic development, it's just not about non-economic development, it's everyone. Tell a community's authentic story. It goes back to my Silicon Valley thing. Is it's just I, what is unique about your market, your community that you can really people get behind, and build off of that. And the last is start and be patient. This is emerging. It takes a while. Um, 
And that's where the, the, the trust building comes in. So I mentioned that we put this to work. We said, okay, this is a theory. We got to test this. So we um, put it in something called eShip Communities, where we said, let's go test this theory in four very different communities in the U.S. Baltimore, Maryland, Kansas City, Missouri, Central New Mexico, which has got a laboratory, small city of Santa Fe and Albuquerque with rural in between, and then Long Beach, California, which sits in between two mega counties and doesn't pull off either one of them and has this phenomenal ecosystem and no one can really figure out why. So I'll just show a quick video on this. Ooh. There's enough room for entrepreneurs and this is the future. An entrepreneurial ecosystem builder is a community organizer for entrepreneurs. Is a connector. <laughs> it helps individuals, organizations, and community get connected. It's about identifying where barriers exist, even unspoken barriers, you know, where things have been just insurmountable, basically, for folks to access resources that do exist in our region. It's someone who is willing to sit down and have a lot of individual conversations to understand what's happening and to connect and to put things together, right? Both within this individual level, right? Like an individual entrepreneurial level, but also what's happening at the system. They really have a systems view of things. They're looking at the context to understand the systems that are keeping what's around in place. And so we're really trying to build a new system. There are so many pockets of our city where entrepreneurial ideas are starting, but not all get the same recognition. You have population centers, and then you have rural areas surrounding those centers. And if they're not connected, then the flow of resources doesn't really exist necessarily to the people that it needs to reach. It's something like 85% use their own funds to be able to get uh, their business started. Automatically sets the limit as to what type of businesses and what type of industries that communities of color get into. And so how do we help change that? You can't really divorce the challenges that we're facing now from the historic challenges of, of slavery, Jim Crow, uh, the northern migration. How do we shift the conditions that are marginalizing some folks and over-resourcing other folks in order to reorient it so that everybody has access to sustainable community development? Even though we may struggle with similar issues, every community is different and we all need to be able to generate our own solutions. Fundamental to the mission of eShip Communities is targeting historically underrepresented entrepreneurs and business leaders. You know, what neighborhoods are being left out of our city? Who all in community are being a part of talking about these discussions? In Baltimore, we're really trying to create whole new contexts so that black entrepreneurs can access everything that white entrepreneurs do. But we're doing it in a way that's culturally anchored and really connected to the way black people work together. The neighborhoods that we're working in don't feel supported. And so how do we help these individuals feel that? There is a culture and atmosphere in Kansas City where entrepreneurs feel supported and that there's bringing resources really back to those communities. I think a lot of those barriers can be addressed through cooperative approaches, but that level of organization has yet to be created. We're trying out some ideas we think might work, and we're saying, what's the chance someone in another town, city, municipality takes everything we learn and paints a picture of how to tailor it for your specific community? So those four communities follow these 10 steps in implementing over three, uh, for over three years. So it was a three-year test of what we said is, here's $3 million. After three years, use those design principles and see if it turns into something successful. Um, we made sure to say that after three years, one of the key things is, can you build a sustainable model where you'll have funding 
coming out of it after our, our funding ends, right? Um, and so the process they followed was on finding um, an ecosystem builder. This is very important. No one has a full-time role doing ecosystem building. Everyone's running their own organization and doing it, no one has time. So we um, designed an ecosystem building job description and those four people that you hear talking on that video were all hired to be the ecosystem builder whose day job from the time they wake up to the time they go to bed is nothing about connection in that city. We're seeing that take off in the United States, Northern Indiana, spurred by Notre Dame University, has hired an, an ecosystem builder in Northern Indiana um, and other uh, locations. I, so I was at Notre Dame a couple of years ago. We had a fun session, a whole bunch of economic developers there. We were talking, and they finally said 40 minutes into it, so what do you think? What do you think about our ecosystem? What do you, you guys do a great job. Don't try to compare yourself to anyone else. Well, we just don't, you know, we're running, we just don't have the, have you thought about hiring a, a full-time person to do it and you guys just fund it and the whole room energy changed two years later, they've done it. You just don't want to think about it, right? So that was the first thing. I won't go into that, but it was that they developed a council, a large number of people, and they started assessments and metrics along the way to then test, then is this making sense? Are we on the right path? put it into further design, engage more people, bringing in the mayor's offices and others, because the mayors and traditional people weren't in these groups to start with. That was very key for testing this out to see could it work without having the normal folks in the room first and what have you. In Kansas City, this is this um, they created a it's called the Casey Toolbox. It is now a nonprofit that's been created out of this effort that has um, supported over 40 new businesses starting because of it. So each area has done differently. We're doing the evaluation on it now, um, and that'll be done here probably about in about six months. But I, I, um, they, have been, they have been successful. Um, I have a lot of more slides and other things to talk about. This is longer than I normally talk because I don't like talking at, I like engaging. So I'm gonna, um, and, you, you all are the judge. You can boo me off the stage or you can say whatever, I do whatever. Um, I'll end with, you, you know, you talk about philanthropy and, and, and impact, right? Impact and entrepreneurship. So in Kansas City alone, I, we, we did a retrospective just in 2017. Our, fund, our funding into nonprofits or programs supporting entrepreneurs has helped create 1,790 new businesses over 6,000 new jobs, I, um, the organizations that have been funded have raised an additional $250 million um, and other, other metrics. So when we look at where f the indirect fund, we can't fund directly to the entrepreneur, we're trying to influence the entrepreneur as much as possible. So our, our numbers are strong in Kansas City. If you creatively find ways to find the right people to partner with, and a lot of that is um, just another $12 million grant we did last fall to University of Missouri, Kansas City, whose innovation has done amazing work there. Um, on the national scale, I talked about the national numbers in, in capital. The one I'm most proud of that when Andy and I started this six years ago, he said, what do I want to see? What's the attribution I want to see? I want to see economic development change at the federal level. Really aspirational. Um, folks from the United States Department of Commerce and Economic Development Agency came to that first ESHIP summit in 2017. They now have given us a written statement that because of that learning there and because of our ecosystems playbook, there are over 30 pardon me, $2 billion worth of federal funding out of the Recovery Act um, that goes to cities across the United States is all designed off of our playbook. It gave them the thinking about doing it differently. It gave them new language. It gave them different hope. It gave them ways to deploy money and ideas to deploy money and to sell that money to, to get the, the funding. That's what we set out to do. 
$2 billion going to cities across the United States because of an idea off the back of a napkin sitting in Kansas City at the foundation. And I'm not lying. I mean, that's really the way. I didn't know what was going to. We had no idea any of this was going to work. <laughs> um, and it's coming out. Um, I'm going to stop the yes. Any questions? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I've got a big voice. So, um, so not everyone grows up with the skill set, either through nature or nurture, to um, to have entrepreneurial capability. What what are you doing, or have you got examples of where you've gone into disadvantaged families and got involved at a young age with young young people, the youth, um, to help identify whether they do have the skills and how they can develop and grow to become um, capable yeah. of stepping into these sorts of roles that you talk yeah. about here? Not directly into the family. We've done it through the education starting in funding K-12, so kindergarten through. What we're trying to do is inject more entrepreneurial mindset and wealth building creation language into the curriculum earlier in life. Um, and the research, what we're showing is just the earlier, it was no chance, the earlier you can do that, the better off it is. It, 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 it isn't so much, do I know how to be an entrepreneur, what an entrepreneur is, or do I know it? We're finding it's things like gumption, curiosity, and other type of drive that turns into helps them become entrepreneurial is entrepreneurial my dad didn't have any of that right i tell the story in some of my keynotes that um it took him four years to get a loan he used to pick me up from school in his fifth grade and we go to a lot of a lot of places we went to a bank a lot and i finally said dad why do we go to so many banks and he said i'll tell you when you get older it turns out because it took him four years to be believed, four years to get a loan, and that's because of the zip code area that we lived in and the banking redlining, the color of skin and all that stuff. Had he had the language of entrepreneurship earlier, and I also tell the story, I didn't hear, this is a true story, I did not hear the word entrepreneur until I was 34 years old, and it was at his funeral when a man came up to me and said, your dad was a good person and he was a very good entrepreneur and I looked at that man like he was calling me a Martian. I had I did not know. This is through schooling. I come from LA. I was schooling all over and never heard the word. How many other people aren't getting that language that if they just had that, there's something inside them that clicks. Or forget about the hard to spell word entrepreneurship and talk about something else. So it's a long, it's a long answer. Yeah. We have, we can't, can't get directly into the families. We can convene. They're doing that. We we had an even harder situation in this country because in the eighties, um, the so-called entrepreneurs were emerging, which is when I first heard the word entrepreneur. Unfortunately, they were all somewhat crooked, and they all ended up either in jail or yeah. escaping the nation. So it took many decades, a number of decades before that entrepreneurship. In the US too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, it did. It happened in the U.S. Yeah. My next question is, um, if I can, um, yeah. your purpose of coming to Australia, what, what do, you, do you want to try and achieve from this visit? And have you, uh, I know you've been to Melbourne and a few places, have you actually been able to engage with um, the Kaufmans of Australia to be able to set up somewhat similar programs and are you getting a good response? This is only my second stop. So the first stop was... Um, at the Global Entrepreneurship Congress, which was which was there in um, in in Melbourne, and have been having some conversations. What what do I set out for? Is to listen and learn. That's why I said I don't normally talk as much as I did today. Is to listen and learn and take back. What are the things that are working? What are the things that are not working? Are the things that work that Coffin has done that could help? But it's like it's it's like one of the values. It's it's listening and learning. Is there something that we're seeing? Is there something in Australia where we're seeing that youth earlier on 
have more of an entrepreneurial mindset than others. Um, is that happening? Um, is have traditional, say, economic development and non-traditional to what degree come together to understand that there's that collaboration is the way to solve things um, for entrepreneurs. Um, I like going into places with open, open mind and not assuming because we, you know, one thing that can happen in philanthropy, you get inside yourself too much. I think, you know, you get think tanky and think you've solved it all. Um, but I'm not, um, you know, I don't, I don't come from that. From that. Um, I'd say that in, in one of the philanthropic organizations I, I spoke with, which is very good, is just understanding um, the, the way to, um, from a technology perspective for entrepreneurs, is how to just understanding what are the next spaces as it relates to tech, as it relates, and what are the barriers for those entrepreneurs entering tech. Tech in the US, and this may be other places, it's a curiosity to have about Australia, it, it dominates funding, it dominates donor intention or donor funding intention. Um, it's not diverse enough across the spectrum of businesses that are created. And what we find in the US is that there's a, um, another barrier to entering entrepreneurship or staying there is that if my business doesn't quickly become something cool, uh, whatever it is, then I have failed. The individual feels failure and then steps back. So I'm, those are the types of things. There was, I, I may not have been um, succinct enough, but is that, okay. what sh I mean, back to you, what should I be listening for and what should I be learning on my trip? And that's for anybody. What, what are you curious about? What would you, if I came back, I say, if I came back in six months or a year, what would you have wanted me to study come back and talk about that's maybe not um part my understanding thank you so much for your talk um one thing that i think would be really interesting to understand so when you're making these strategic decisions of funding the e-ship community and then the intermediate body which then could fund other entrepreneurs one thing that got me thinking is when founders have I guess maybe like regulatory or other sort of roadblocks your strategic decision making in a way is quite entrepreneurial because you've had to think of out of the box ways to find a solution what sort of learnings would you suggest um, to guide strategic decision making when you face those hurdles even a you know a foundation that has millions of dollars well, it's going off the research first. I mean, a research informs policy, policy informs program. So most everything we saw was based on data of looking at the amount of entrepreneurs, where they're reporting most of their, either their failure points or their frustration points. Some of that is not all research-based. Some of it was anecdotal just with hearing because some of what entrepreneurs go through doesn't show up in the research. Right, so it's listening. But the capital work, the funding work was all based off the research that showed us the, I'm gonna um, show you, I'm just gonna slip ahead here. Show, oops, I have something on my screen saying to download a, um, a new program. Don't wanna do that. Um, go into capital, boom, that. This type of stuff. That number hasn't moved 83 in four years. It's still 83%. 65% of people are tapping into their personal savings in the US in order to start a business. You're automatically at a deficit, right? And then across the board, we're just showing what, where, the, where the disparity spares you. So it's those type of research that really helps us set a strategic point. What's, what's challenging sometimes in philanthropies for me is that waiting on the research to come out when you see things happening, and sometimes you just gotta jump in and try, which is like we did with the Capital Access Lab, right? Um, is that helpful? I don't know if I answered the question. I wanna make sure, say it again. I guess I'm really interested to understand um, 
Well, I that actually kind of doesn't uh, answer the question because you're just sort of seeing something in action and you're just sort of jumping in, going, "Okay, this is what we need to do." Um, yeah, I can see how it could be frustrating, you know, if the board is saying, oh, we need data to do this. Um, I think, and you've probably heard this before, Australia is quite a risk adverse market. So even in the startup space, that can be um, the case as well, where sometimes um, a bo the board could be like, oh, well, we, 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 you know, we need some data to support this yeah. strategic exactly. direction. Yeah. Well, and that's where, um, like we do with the banks in Kansas City, you know, they weren't coming along. It's, you can't, you have to meet people halfway. They have very risk averse. We said, we get it. We, we wish you'd come up with the products on your own, but we understand. And so we said, how about if we put up 9 million to make it easier for you? And then it worked. In other words, it's starting to work. <laughs> but it's not all, philanthropy can't come up with it all on its own. And if you're not listening and understanding other people's community viewpoints and what their pain points are, then that's when philanthropy gets in, philanthropy can get in trouble. I say, we know it all by ourselves and we're just gonna go ahead and do it. And it ha you haven't listened to one person in the community, right? You've gotta listen, you've gotta be in the community and understand and be, where I talk about an economic actor is just being at the table and it's okay if you don't come up with it all by yourself. Um, but philanthropy feels that pressure. The other press two point is boards, right? So everyone, we're all stewards of the philanthropic money. And sometimes boards can sway a little bit too conservative and sometimes they come back. The key is risk, it's an investment. Program dollars are risk investment. You're not expecting return on those. The return you're looking for is the change in society. It doesn't always work, but you have to risk. Now, if you're taking the money out of the endowment side of the foundation, so let me just say, so you ask 5%, you have to spend 5% of your total endowment dollar wise in the US. So through, we have a close to $3 billion invested endowment. So that means 150 million we must spend a year or that we can get penalized. Odd model, get penalized for not spending a lot of money. And I came out of corporate, I was like, that, that just doesn't make. Right. Um, and so that's 150 mil, what about the other part? And so you'll hear things like called mission related investments or an MRI. That's where the foundation is taking it out of the investment side and making a big play but it does expect an investment coming back. So it's a risk in a different way. I wanna see more philanthropy do that. If you look at the trillions of dollars out there, could you do that? Is that let maybe less risky for philanthropy? Maybe try that because you'll get a return back. So there are different ways, but um, I'm not opposed to risk aversion, I understand it. And especially when you're you're the steward of the money of the donor. And you gotta spend everything right, the best you can. But Mr. Kaufman said, risk, fail fast, try it again. Try it. If it doesn't work, try it again. Um, and so we try to balance risk aversion plus being risky. What else? I know it's a lot of words this early in the morning putting people to sleep. I know a lot of slides. I, um, I don't, yes. Hello, Antonio Ruffle from Start Giving. Um, I mean, Kaufman's legacy was clearly pretty amazing. And I'm interested to know whether you see similar attitudes or different attitudes to philanthropy amongst those entrepreneurs that you're investing in and those newer entrepreneurs that are coming through now. Um, their opinions on philanthropy? The, the entrepreneurs themselves? Well, I suppose that their appetite for philanthropy and oh. the way in which that they do, the, the way in which they yeah. carry out their philanthropy and their giving, is it the same or is it is it different? Are there new emerging trends there? Oh, so entrepreneurs that are starting foundations themselves. Mm. Oh, it's all over the board. It's, it's all over the board um, because you have athletes starting foundations, right? 
and most of those I see are more are more community based. You have family foundations, entrepreneurs that are starting family foundations, and then you have corporate foundations. So it's really a, across the board. I do see it becoming more. What's the right word? Not liberal. I, I, it just is. They're more starting. And the younger entrepreneurs that are starting them, or the newer entrepreneurs that are starting the foundations, are wanting to do creative things with them, not just the normal type type of models. Um, there's an emergence of of philanthropy in the U.S. that's really looking at it's, it's through solving problems, but as immediate as possible, right? Um, but it's a wide it's a wide range. It's very much a wide range. If it's got a question, and then we've got one over here. Okay. I was just going to ask, you mentioned it, um, working with a couple of universities, and I wanted to tell us something about one of the most innovative or the latest match you've made. Yeah, so um, interesting. By the way, Penn State University, um, is they have, a, they have a research to policy um, area where they are teaching um Policymaker staffs on entrepreneurship, and so that when a bill may come up or legislation may come up, they can understand how there's a, a more more diverse set of research that's taught to the legislator staffs, so that when the legislator is on the floor of the Senate or the House, they're more educated as it relates to entrepreneurship. It's really cool. Um, they also just, I, I, they, off of our playbook, they've now created a Penn State playbook because um, they have a very interesting model. Uh, they have 21 campuses across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, which they are um, turning, they're called, it's their Invent Penn State initiative. And they have on each, in each city, not on the campuses, I call a launch box which is an entrepreneurship, economic development, and community development hub. And they've just written a playbook on how they did that. Um, and they have a fantastic, just that's, they're using it as a distribution model of not only education, but education showing up in community to be more relevant to community. There are other research uh, universities, um, mostly, um, I would say mostly our research um, angle is with universities and other research done from that perspective. Um, I think you know, there's, but um, at University of Missouri, Kansas City, our research, uh, our dollars go into what's called digital sandbox. And what that is, it's a, it's a um, three or four cohorts a year of entrepreneurs that go through training, tech entrepreneurs that go through training, uh, creating companies. So it ranges. It, it, it really ranges. We do want to see in the U.S. Um, and commercial from a commercialization perspective, more of that IP coming out and into market. So we're thinking through some commercialization angles as well. But probably our most popular program research overall was something called Kaufman Campuses about 10 years ago. So there were $5 million grants to 10 universities across the states to create their entrepreneurship centers. So they if you go to University of North, North Carolina at Chapel Hill, that entrepreneurship center there was off of our built up there, Purdue and a few others. We just look at different angles over time. I might ask the final question, unless there's anyone else with a question. Um, through the lens of economic development, there's obviously a large role for government to play. One of the things that's different about the role that philanthropy can play is you can be consistent. And so you see government programs kind of wax yeah. and wane based on different administrations or, or individual ministers or kind of elected members. But with philanthropy, you can sort of keep a consistent line. Um, and I know that the Kaufman Foundation has tried many, many different things um, over the years. But I'm curious, is there a small handful that have just been consistent that you sort of consistently keep doing? What what has been the sort of most effective, consistent over consistent. the long term? In entrepreneurship, it's entrepreneurship data, uh, capital access, 
So we help fund the Angel Capital Association, get that started. The Kaufman Fellows Program is now globally. If you know what the Kaufman, anyone, the Kaufman Fellow in the room? Um, and Kaufman Fellows is um, venture capitalists, um, a fellowship of people in VC that want to grow their, and so it's education curriculum to, to become a better venture capitalist, uh, which has now grown to that program at over 800 venture capitalists over time. Um, they now have $1 trillion in assets under management collectively. And that all started sitting in Kansas City years ago. So just playing in capital and finding new ways in capital access. So research, entrepreneurship data, capital access, and entrepreneur learning would be the three pillars that are consistent. Entrepreneur learning, Fast Track is our longest standing program over 25 years, 1 million cups, 12 years. Um, capital has been over that same arc and research has been, I think, since 2002. And then locally in Kansas City, it's the Kaufman School. It's just K through 12 education. So those are the things you, you try to, you, now the key though is how often do you change your strategy in that work? So we're going through a strategic review. It seems like Kaufman every eight years, it's like we're, we're giving, people are gonna need a seasick pill here, back and forth, but it, I'm just kidding. But philanthropy does that, right? And, bo and whether it's boards or senior leadership teams or whatever, some of it's also driven off the data. I don't, don't want to blame the boards or blame the leadership team. Don't get me wrong. Um, but it's sometimes the data will show that program that you're doing, you're going down the right path. You're going to have to switch it. Back to Mr. Kaufman, fail, fail fast. Try something different. If you stay too long with something, you become irrelevant. Or could it? Um, I really want to thank uh, Phil for, for joining us Uh Multiple times uh, when I've kind of asked him, you know, about coming to Australia, he's like, I'm here to learn, uh, which is which is fantastic. Um, I really I think it kind of really embodies that kind of Kaufman spirit. They are really the world leading foundation at supporting entrepreneurship and they still have that mindset that, that they don't have all the answers. And, you know, they publish a lot of their research and, and also are curious um, when they come here. Um, Philip touched on a, a number of points. The thing that kind of struck me the most was that that story of Maria. And I think you, you really encapsulated the work of an entrepreneurial ecosystem quite succinctly as there are a group of people with great energy and ideas for the future. Um, they need resources. <laughs> there are people with those resources and, and the role of that entrepreneurial ecosystem reducing that friction um, for those people. And I like that diagram of kind of Maria wandering around her community and there's a path dependency to sort of introductions to the right person um, actually, just before this event, I had a founder in the space who was sort of like, yeah, as a piece of um, software is trying to sell to the university. He's like, who within the university should I talk to? And so I spent, you know, half an hour with him helping him navigate. So that was a really fantastic story. And um, just kind of summarizes the work of the founders program, uh, a team of ecosystem builders who see to kind of reduce that friction. Um, so with that, thank you. Um, we have the space until 1130. Please, please stay and join us. Um, we have some refreshments down the back. Thanks very much, everyone. <laughs>